him the link. He didn't have it. Timothy, once we start, it will be on, like you'll take, take it, right? Yes. For the introductions and everything. Cool. Okay. J uh, Jacob, did you, did you want me to introduce the speakers or would you like to introduce the speakers? Well, you, can do, you can do it. Okay. That's why you're the moderator. Okay. Okay, we are live. Okay. Uh, well, one um, second and Reverend Tyler is joining us as well. Yeah. Reverend Tyler is here, okay. Excellent. So welcome to this evening's program. I am Timothy Welbeck. I am the civil rights attorney for the Philadelphia chapter of Council on American Islamic Relations. And we've convened tonight to honor our nation's most iconic civil rights leader, the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as our nation pauses to celebrate his legacy, we wanted to discuss not only his legacy, but the implications of what his legacy means in the era of Black Lives Matter. And tonight I am joined by some esteemed colleagues, beginning with my executive director, the executive director of Council on American Islamic Relations, Jacob Bender, to my right. We also have a distinguished panel of speakers. We have Dr. Rashida Abdul Kabir. We have Rabbi Mordecai Lebling, Lebling I'm sorry. Uh, we have Imam Kenneth Nuruddin, and we also have Reverend Mark Kelly Tyler, who will be joining remarks. I'm also joined by my colleague Ahmed Tegliglu. Um, he is with us tonight as well. And so we will discuss the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his legacy, what we can take from his legacy today, what would it mean, or what would he think about the context of today's movements and things of that nature. Um, Jacob, before we begin our program, did you have any remarks you'd like to share? Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Shalom, salam, peace be on to you. Uh, as Timothy said, this is a momentous day every year in which we celebrate and honor the activism and the life and the martyrdom um, of Dr. King. Um, our panelists represent the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions that is part of the wonderful makeup of the city of Philadelphia. And I and CARE have been honored to work with uh, many of the clergy and their congregants um, in producing this program and many others before um, COVID hit and turned us all into Zoom nights. Um, as we progress through this evening, um, keep in mind that uh, CARE is the producer of this program. Uh, we exist because of your general, generous support that helps us keep uh, the hope alive. And we welcome your support, your questions, uh, your donations um, to make programs like this possible throughout the year um, as we both celebrate the life of Dr. King and keep alive the memory of his resistance, which is so important in today's world. So, um, turn back to Timothy, you can introduce our speakers who will be making uh, initial remarks of about nine to 10 minutes. We will have our initial remarks made by Dr. Rashida, who is going. Okay. <laughs> you, you look surprised that I was called. Is it all right that, that you go first? No, it's perfectly fine. Um, so we'll begin with you and have you offer some remarks on, on Dr. King, his legacy, and, um, and then we'll go on to the rest of our speakers. Uh, good evening uh, to all. Um, Assalamu alaikum and peace be unto all of you. Um, I uh, had planned to uh, begin with really um, 
reminding us or presenting um, a definition of what we mean by legacy, um, because I think that gives us a good beginning um, for um, some of our uh, remarks and our question and answers, so that we also be operating on the same platform. Um, think of legacy as uh, a gift, uh, a bequest transmitted by or received from the past. The mark that is left behind on the world reflecting the richness of an individual's life and what they deem to have accomplished and the impact that it left on the world. What, uh, what framework Dr. King left for us as a model is his legacy. And it is to stand and speak power to truth. And we know that it takes courage and commitment and sacrifice to achieve equity and justice. To be conscious and aware, to be present and, and very much aware of the injustices that we experience. To do what is right because it is right. To relieve the suffering of humanity to transform the threats to our very being, to protect, to create structural change through nonviolence, to be aware, to analyze and engage in change beneficial to all of us, and to inspire others to that awareness. While legal um, equality has uh, been gained to a certain degree, racism did not end. The economic and educational injustices have remained keeping the masses subdued in poverty and desperation. There is a, a hadith in Islam that um, gives us an, an instruction to verify our responsibility uh, to humanity. And to paraphrase it, it says, if you see a rock in the road, note that the rock is not mine and this is not my road, but I have moved the rock to clear the road so the passing through for someone else is not obstructed or harmed by its presence. That is the commitment to legacy, to move the rock for others that it may benefit us. Assalamu Thank you, so um, thank you for those marks, Dr. Rashida. And Dr. Rashida is a board member for Council on American Islamic Relations. She is a fierce uh, um, advocate for public health and health equity. She has over 35 years of experience practicing as a nurse and also creating and, and advocating for different health um, ending different health disparities throughout the United States, particularly as it relates to HIV and AIDS contraction. And we thank you for sharing those remarks with us tonight. And we will, we will circle back with you later on after our other panelists have spoken and, and present some questions to you and the like. Um, next, we will hear from Rabbi Mordecai Libling. He is and also a fierce advocate for social justice, equality, and equity. He is um, the director of a newly formed organization, Social Justice Organizing Program at the Reconstructionist, Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. And Rabbi Mordecai is also going to share with us his remarks on Dr. King's legacy. Rabbi Mordecai, you are currently muted. Me on mute, thank you. Okay. Shalom Aleichem, Salam Aleichem, peace be unto you. And thank you for the honor of participating on, on this panel. The, the question posed to us, as Dr. Rashida said, is what is Dr. King's legacy in this era of Black Lives Matter? And primarily, I want to lift up his radical message especially since his birthday has become a national holiday, there has been an effort to tone down his message, focusing more on his famous I have a dream speech at the March on Washington than on what he was saying for the last five years of his life. In his groundbreaking address at the Riverside Church in 1967, in April 1967, exactly one year before he was assassinated, 
he said, and I'm going to quote at length, our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo and, and unjust moors and thereby speed the day when every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. A genuine revolution of values means in the final analysis that our loyalties become, must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to humankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in our individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all embracing and unconditional love for all. When I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another for love is God and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God for God is love. If we love one another, God dwells in us and love is perfected in us. Those were his words exactly a year before he died. I'd like to break some of this down. Dr. King talks about the evils of poverty, racism, and militarism, known as the triplets of evil. Sometimes he substituted the word materialism for poverty. These evils are still with us almost unbelievably. The poverty rate in America today is higher than when Dr. King gave that speech, and that is not factoring in the results of the pandemic. And we in Philadelphia know it better than most with the highest poverty rate of any major city and tens of thousands of people going to sleep hungry every day in our city. I don't need to tell this audience about racism, but just looked at who has been most affected by the pandemic, whether in terms of getting sick, dying, losing income, or lack of internet access for school children. Perhaps less well known are some of the facts about militarism. The United States is still the single biggest military spender in the world. We have a military budget that is greater than the next 10 countries combined, more than rivals like China and Russia and allies, Saudi Arabia, United Kingdom and France altogether. In 2019, the militarized budget amounted to over almost two thirds of our discretionary spending. A related concept is the militarized budget. In recognition that the US maintains both the world's highest military spending and the highest incarceration rates, the militarized budget includes the traditional military budget, as well as spending on veterans affairs, homeland security, incarceration, law enforcement, immigration enforcement, and the still ongoing war on drugs. And this budget is well over a trillion dollars or 90% of federal discretionary spending. If we spent on the military the average amount that the next top 10 spenders spend, we could eliminate poverty and have health care for all. Dr. King was not afraid to criticize the sacred cow of the military. And since his death, we have seen the militarization of the police and the carceral system. He was not afraid to say that our taxes were going to fund war and we must take on the military industrial prison complex, which if anything has become more powerful since his death. The platform of the movement for Black Lives Matter, which was released this summer, addresses the triplets of evil, the triplet of evils of poverty, racism, and militarism. As I mentioned, Dr. King would sometimes substitute the word materialism for poverty, he brought our attention to being a society too focused on things, a society obsessed with consumption. 
we need to reorganize our priorities, he called on us to do. And this was decades before our obsessions with cell phones and computers. He calls for a revolutionary spirit and a revolution in values. We all know that he chose his words deliberately. He intentionally uses the word revolution. Dr. Vincent Harding, one of Dr. King's closest colleagues, he in fact wrote the draft of the speech I quoted. And after Dr. King's death, Coretta Scott King asked Dr. Harding to be in charge of Martin Luther King's papers. Dr. Harding in his book, Martin Luther King, Inconvenient Hero, documents King's evolution after the 1963 March on Washington, a process of radicalization. Harding wrote, the nightmarish time between dream and visions was now possessing Martin Luther King. He had begun to face the fact that he, he would have to organize confrontative, revolutionary, nonviolent opposition to his own government in order to move toward a new compassionate America. In those years, he began to think that the federal government, which he had called on for over a decade to guarantee civil rights, would not take the steps necessary to bring about the great changes needed to eliminate the triplet of evils. This would take a mass movement of civil disobedience to make the needed changes. This is in fact what he intended the Poor People's Campaign to be. As Dr. Harding wrote, central to his vision was the possibility of developing a major national nonviolent movement, which would call on the fires in the hearts of the young men and women who are now the victims of America. He envisioned a nonviolent army, a, a movement that would cripple the operation of an oppressive society that would listen to the cries of the poor. Dr. King began teaching that we needed deep structural changes in our country well before people began using the phrase structural racism. In his last speech to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1967, he said, quote, we must go from this convention and say, America, you must be reborn again. Your whole structure must be changed. And he insisted that the problem of racism, the problem of economic exploitation, and the problem of war are all tied together. What undergirds all of this for Dr. King is love. That is the constant throughout his life. In his Riverside speech, he quotes the historian Arnold Toynbee, quote, love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word. From the belief that God is love, Dr. King understood that we are all connected, as in his phrase, we are wrapped in a mutual garment of destiny, or when he said that something that affects one of us affects all of us. He knew and taught that we are all interconnected, that our happiness, fulfillment, and safety is mutually dependent. One of the most important Jewish theologians of the 20th century was Abraham Joshua Heschel. He was a good friend of Dr. King's. In fact, if Dr. King hadn't been murdered a few weeks later, he was to be at Dr. Heschel's house for a Passover Seder. And just 10 days before the assassination, Dr. Heschel brought him to a convention of rabbis and introduced Dr. King with these words. Martin Luther King Jr. is a voice, a vision, and away. I call upon every Jew to hearken to his voice, to share his vision, to follow his way. The whole future of America will depend on the impact and influence of Dr. King. Following Dr. Heschel, I do believe that not only the future of America, but in fact, the future of the world depends on following that vision. To honor Dr. King, to embrace his legacy, we need to organize that which has never existed, a spiritually based life-giving revolution seeking for the fundamental reordering of the institutions of society in the world's most technologically organized, militarily equipped, and materialistically oriented society. This revolution must be committed to nonviolence massive civil disobedience and love. Assalamu alaikum.
Salaikum Salam. Thank you um, for those words, Rabbi Mordecai, particularly in the reminder of Dr. King's admonishments for us to remember the poor and working to deconstruct the militarization of our nation. Um, we will next have some remarks from Imam Kenneth Nuruddin. Um, Imam Kenneth is one of the founding imams and the first resident imam for a United um, Muslim Masjid here in the city of Philadelphia. He is one of the more celebrated leaders here in our community, having also taught Arabic at Temple 12. And he is going to offer us some remarks here. Okay, uh, to the family who is hearing us, uh, good evening and peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. And I would be remiss if I left one of my uh, positions out. I also was taught at Sister Claire Muhammad School for a long number of years. And the reason why I mentioned her is because in the 30s and the 40s, she actually started the homeschool movement for education. And that was one of the rights that we know were denied our people. Uh, so, you know, I was there for 15 years. I'm still the resident imam there at the Philadelphia Messier Claire Muhammad School. Now, I would like to echo what Sister Rashida, our beloved Dr. Rashida, has said to us. And looking at legacy, uh, the legacy is a reminder to us. And we always want to remember where we came from so we know where we have to go. But we also should show appreciation because no matter how bad things may seem today, when we look back, we can see incremental progress on some levels. And the thing that Dr. King should remind us of is that we have so much work to do that in showing that we remember and showing that we appreciate, it should inspire and encourage us to perfect what contributions we have to make. Because the speech that he was to give the day after he was assassinated, <clears throat> where do we go from here? And I think when we look at, uh, you know, just what demands are placed on all of us today, we have to be reminded that as he said, he wanted to be remembered as a drum major for justice. And that is a leader who is not just marching without any purpose and not marching by himself. He had and he has and he should have behind him all the instruments that are necessary to impart the message that is needed. Uh, as Dr. Rashida mentioned one hadith about moving something from the road, there's another uh, saying of the prophet. He said, when you see something wrong, you have to do something about it with your hand. If you don't do anything, you should say something. If you don't say anything, at least know what's wrong in your heart. Don't be complacent or be comfortable or be accepting of injustices. So we have to take the position that Dr. King left in his legacy. And that was anytime you see an injustice, Number one, you get the facts. Number two, you go to the source of the injustice and you present your case. Number three, you go and get your own house in order. And then number four, you take action, you take a position. Now, with all that is confronting us today, and I think, well, the subtopic is Black Lives Matter. And we know Dr. King stood up for civil rights and then he shifted or he, he not shifted, but he evolved to the economic rights. Rather than just be limited to Black Lives Matter, I would like us to expand it and say Black life matters because the life has an economic base. When we look at all the fault lines that exist in this environment, our people have been isolated from the time we have come here. Whether it was in chattel slavery, coming out of chattel slavery, Jim Crow, uh, economic discrimination, no access to jobs, 
separate and unequal schools, uh, discriminatory law enforcement, criminal justice, they have always been fault lines where our people were isolated. And the question we have to ask is whose fault line is it? And in many cases, we have to take responsibility for some of the fault lines. Um, so in being reminded by the legacy of Dr. King, we should show our appreciation for what he did by continuing the work that is left unfinished and perfecting our efforts. And the way we perfect our efforts is we have to examine what we're doing. And we have to take a, a very serious look in the mirror and realize that as Michael Jackson said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror <laughs> and go from there. So again, we have a legacy that we have inherited. And that legacy didn't just come from Dr. King, but it's a legacy that comes from all of our religious traditions. As the rabbi mentioned, not just Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Baha'ism, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, but we have a legacy of people who have faith in not only something bigger, but we believe that if we commit ourselves to higher ideals and purposes in life, then we can begin to face and address some of the issues that we are confronted with. So just be reminded that Dr. King left us a legacy. And uh, with all that we are facing today, I would like to say Black life matters. All life matters, not just the lives, not just the physical life, but um, the full composure, the full complexity of what life means to all of us. Again, let us be reminded that the dream was not a dream. It became a reality. The dream was just an inspiration. But he marched as a drum major, leading a coordinated effort that had some position, that had some structure to it, that had some direction, it had goals and objectives. And we have to look at all the issues that we're confronted with and apply those same principles. Thank you, Imam Kenneth, for those remarks and reminding us of the complexities of the advocacy for our life and eradicating all of the different systems that seek to disenfranchise or harm that life. We will now have some remarks from Reverend Dr. Mark Kelly Tyler. He is the senior pastor of the historic Mother Bethel AME Church here in the city of Philadelphia. He also is a theological professor at a Methodist Theological Seminary of Ohio. He has extensive experience both in theological education and also in pastoral ministry. And we are pleased to have him join us here this evening. Thank you so very much and peace to all of you. Um, Salam Aleikum, Shalom, and glad to be here on this evening with all of you with uh, care. Glad to see so many familiar faces. And um, you know, I've been talking about Dr. King since my morning radio show at 6 a.m. all day long, and um, we can't talk enough about this. Listen to this headline from CNN. The day America realized how dangerous Donald Trump is. Now, when I saw that, I couldn't help but have a little fun with it. And so I did a little editing of my own, and I inserted a word and posted it on Facebook. The day white America realized how dangerous Donald Trump is. Now, I'm looking at this incredible room that we are in and the, the various expressions of faith and culture and community that are just in this tiny Zoom space right now. Um, you know, my, my dear Muslim sister and brothers, my dear Jewish brother, Mordecai, who we work together with power, interfaith, who, by the way, um, was in Charlottesville, holed up in a church with friends of mine as white supremacists marched around that church with tiki torches saying, Jews will not replace us and other hateful things. 
And I want to say that the only people who are surprised by what happened at the Capitol in the insurrection on last week are persons who have intentionally not been paying attention. Donald Trump's campaign began with an attack on Barack Obama's birth and his birth narrative. Birtherism was a way of giving white Americans an excuse not to accept Barack Obama as president. For if he's not truly born here, then he really was never president to begin with. And we can wipe away his accomplishment of becoming the first African-American president. He rolled that way. In fact, some would say you can go back a little further to his full page ad about the Central Park Five, where he called for their execution. And even in spite of, you know, all of the evidence and the confession of the actual rapist and their exoneration to this day has yet to apologize to those young men and their families and continues to double down by saying, well, they admitted to it. He, is, he has ridden on the wave of hatred toward everybody represented in this Zoom meeting space. The first official act forced many of us to the airport in Philadelphia. He hadn't been president a few weeks. And we were at, at the airport, walking in the streets, trying to allow Muslim families who, in mid-flight, the cruelty of it, to let someone go through the process of getting a visa, packing, spending all their money, and in mid-flight from a nation to this country, only to land to discover that you must now turn around and go back home. The, 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 the hatred that led to putting children in cages, the, the, the ramping up in the incitement of white supremacists in Charlottesville, couldn't even denounce them. And CNN in 2021 has the audacity to write a headline the day America realized how dangerous Donald Trump is. I mean, it's downright offensive is what it is. And, and so when I think about the legacy, thank you for that word, uh, Dr. Rashida, the legacy of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., that, that this legacy weighs heavy on us this evening. Because most years we get to come and we have a nice breakfast and we can have our coffee and our danishes and whatever, and we hear a wonderful speech and we go out and do a day of service and some of us turn up and do an action or whatever. But in this moment right now, if we ever needed to live out the legacy of a Dr. King, it is right now. There are 20,000 American troops in the United States Capitol because we cannot be assured the peaceful transfer of power, something that we have taken for granted since the first transfer of power happened <laughs> as a result of an election that happened in this city. And here, this is the state of America right now. Our capital is surrounded in Harrisburg. In Trenton, it's surrounded. In every state house in America right now, there are National Guard troops because of the hatred that this man has ginned up. And on the one hand, I want to say that it's just Donald Trump. Now his Twitter account is gone, and we can just kind of move on back to life as normal. But on the other hand, those of us in this call and in this space, Jewish community, Muslim community, Black Christian community, we know that it's not just Donald Trump. He has become the, the, the most articulate in espousing it and has used it as a lightning rod, but that it comes from a much deeper place. Those who are new arrivals to America who then say to those of us who came on slave ships in the 16 and 1700s, we want to take our country back. <laughs> like, Which one? Which European country? <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> and, but this is what we are facing in this moment. The, the idea that the election was stolen simply because Black organizers on the ground in places like Philadelphia, Atlanta, and Detroit just outworked you. But it is an easy lie to believe because for far too many people, the only thing that we get is something that is handed to us or something that we have stolen. And so what is this legacy calling for us to do in this moment? It's calling for us to remember 
that it is not just simply about demagogues like Donald Trump who come along and work up the crowd into a frenzy, but it is about the deep-seated ways in which white supremacy is always at work in every system and in every layer. I wrote a blog piece a few years ago about the Camden, New Jersey riot, Election Day riot of 1870, one year before Octavius Cattle was killed in Philadelphia on Election Day. In 1870, there was a similar riot in Camden. I used to pastor there before coming to Mother Bethel. And I was intrigued because one of the members of our church in 1870 at Macedonia Camden was killed as a result of that riot. Lost his life trying to cast his vote there in um, uh, East uh, South Camden. But what was most interesting was not only did these people come and this mob that came over from Philadelphia to break up these black voters exercising their right to vote, smashing the ballot box, but they were assisted by off-duty Philadelphia police officers who took the ferry over. They were called Mayor Fox's police. They were called Fox's police. They were, they were thugs for hire who were brought over by the political forces who wanted to stop the franchise, franchisement of black voters in 1870 in Camden, and they did their job with precision. And here we are now in 2021, only to discover that in the Capitol on that day of uh, Reverend Tyler, you muted yourself. All right, my audio just went out, so I'm using my computer audio, so I hope you can still hear me. Great. And so here we are now in 2021. And who shows up at the nation's capital? but one of the persons responsible with recruiting Philadelphia police officers at the Capitol, reinforcing the lie that something was stolen. And yet we are supposed to believe that she checks that attitude at the door when she comes into work and she is vetting officers. Isn't it a coincidence that the least diverse incoming class in the academy happened on last year? an almost all white class of Philadelphia police recruits. And yet one of the persons who's responsible for bringing in new recruits and vetting and clearing them was at the Capitol saying that black people stole an election. Seven SEPTA police officers down at the Capitol on last week. And so this says to me that a part of the work that has to go on and I'll end with this has to be how do we not only celebrate what Dr. King did back then, but how do we move that today? Rabbi Mordecai preached about that at church on Sunday. Um, in fact, I talked about uh, the, the prophet Samuel when he was called through a dream. And I said, you gotta remember the entire dream. We stop in the reading of the uh, Old Testament for us, the Hebrew Bible for you, with the fact that Samuel was called in a dream. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And we all stop there. What a wonderful, cute story. But the dream that the Lord gave to him was one that reshaped everything in society, which overthrew Eli and his corrupt sons and their administration that stole from the people, that abused their power and their authority, and restored a righteous government and governing of the people at Shiloh. That's the entire dream. And so we got to then recapture. So what does King's speaking about militarism mean in 2021. In Philadelphia, it means that we've got to talk about defunding the police in a real way. There's no sense that we have a budget in Philadelphia for policing that is higher than any other budget, including education. Almost a billion dollars for policing. And I ask you, do you feel safer as a result? In a city that has watched almost 500 people murdered last year with a clearance rate and homicides of 15%, and we pour more money into it as though more money into policing makes us safer, it does not. What makes us safer is a living wage. What makes us safer are good schools that produce scholars who go on to be productive citizens, who buy homes, who raise families, who pay taxes and love their neighborhoods so they don't need to go out to rob, kill, and shoot anyone. What makes us safer is quality housing that we raise people in so that children are not growing up in homes where they're eating lead paint chips off of the windowsills. 
And so what makes us safer is an investment back in people. Rabbi Mordecai, thank you for reading that because I, I love that part where King says that we need a people-centered value system. That in this country, there was a gov lieutenant governor in Georgia in the height of COVID-19 who said that he would rather die then let the economy of Texas suffer. And he felt most older Texans felt the same way. That's a money center. It is not the economy stupid, it's the people stupid. And when we put people as a priority and invest in people, you don't need a billion dollars for policing because people will police themselves and act accordingly. So I'm gonna stop there, my 10 minutes is up, but I thank you and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Pastor Tyler, for those remarks and for reminding us of where our attention should be. And that's actually where I wanted to begin with you all as a panel. There's often a great deal of cognitive dissonance on King Day, as, as many of you all have suggested in your own ways. We, we get up, as Pastor, as Pastor Mark said, we get up, we have a nice breakfast, we might do some service, we might cherry pick our favorite King quote put it on social media and then go on about our day and live lives as usual. But in many ways that misses the mark, particularly even from some of the people who are leading some of these efforts. I saw and annually um, the FBI issues a statement commemorating the legacy of Dr. King. ICE released a statement today commemorating the legacy of Dr. King. Various members of the Trump administration issue their statements commemorating the legacy of Dr. King. And so I guess what I wanted to pose to you all is if we could build on some of these ideas that, that Pastor Mark was saying and talk about how we can move beyond some of the symbolism of this day and create real meaningful change, march towards solutions, and in that way, honoring the legacy of Dr. King. Is that directed at anybody in particular? Oh, my apologies. Any that's that's directed to, to our panel as a whole. Any of you are welcome to answer that. Okay, well, I guess that takes us back to where do we go from here? And you know, one issue that uh Reverend Tyler mentioned, uh, when it comes to uh the infiltration, or we shouldn't say infiltration, the exposure of white supremacy and law enforcement. We know the slave patrols, the origins of law enforcement in this country, but it has become so um, alarming that the FBI and Department of Homeland Security said this is a very huge problem because the mentioning of the SEPTA police, uh, the training officer, there were 15 law enforcement agencies who were present in Washington inside the Capitol inside the grounds. And it is so alarming that the Department of Defense and the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff had to issue a directive to the soldiers reminding them whose side they should be on. Because the increase in white supremacy is not just the Boogaloo Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and all the others, but we can look in history and see the case with Emmett Till with many of the lynchings, the police, they were either complicit or they instigated the crowd to lead the charge. So this is something that we have to take it upon ourselves here in Philadelphia. Uh, we can be responsible for police throughout the country, but in Philadelphia, we should be down with the police commissioner this week once uh, the new administration is settled in and we are pretty, we'll just say we, we have an opportunity to have a clear uh, avenue. We should demand that some answers be given to us and we have to pose our questions, but uh, you know, it's unacceptable that you can have those who are supposed to enforce the law who are to serve and protect. As Dr. Tyler said, they don't leave their uh, feelings at the door when they report into work, they take it with them. So that's one thing we have to do. We have to get the facts.
and we have to make demands and we have to hold people accountable and we should stay on an issue until it's resolved rather than go from one side of the buffet to the other side. Uh, Imam uh, Nordin, thank you for that. That's, that. that's perfect because I agree, I couldn't agree with you more. In Philadelphia in 2020 in the November election, one of the things that we passed as a community, overwhelmingly so, is that the Police Advisory Commission, formerly known as the PAC, would be abolished and that we would now have independent civilian led police oversight. I am deeply concerned because that was a demand that Power Live Free actually took to city council and the mayor prior to the summer of uh, George Floyd's killing and everyone else. We've been on the, beating that drum for about a year or two. And now there's a lot of mystery around, you know, what this commission will look like. And, you know, if the rumblings that I'm getting are out of city hall are right, then we ought to all be highly concerned. This commission, the spirit of the law that was passed by the people, I believe, was one that would be elected by the people and for the people. There's no other way that you can hold commissioners accountable if you don't directly put them in. If they are appointed in some kind of way by the mayor or city council, we will get what we have always had, which is nothing. And to move to full police oversight, we need an independent board that can ultimately, now it won't happen in this first wave because there are more changes to the home rule charter that has to happen. But we need a board that does like other cities, that one hires and fires its own police commissioner. In Oakland and San Francisco, the commissioner is not hired by the mayor. It's hired by, that, by those independent boards. We need a board like in Chicago that is the initial investigator for police involved shootings. They see body worn camera footage before the police department sees it and they lead the investigations on it. We need basically a commission that runs the entire police department. I would say even controls their budget, oversees their hiring, oversees their discipline and everything related to the police department because elected officials have proven to us time and time again that you can't take money from the FOP on the one hand and then be for the people on the other hand. If you want FOP money, that's fine, but you can't have anything to do with overseeing the police department. So we need an independent body. That's something that all of us as a, as a city need to stay on top of. And Power Live Free is working on that issue. We look forward to other partners who will work with us and continue to press city council to give us that kind of oversight. And if I may add just one more thing to that, um, we have the right and the responsibility because anytime there's an egregious action by law enforcement, the entire citizenry of Philadelphia has to pay the costs for whatever lawsuits. Now, if the FOP wants to pay all the lawsuits and indemnify their officers, then you can decide whether you want to keep a bad apple. But if the cost of the lawsuits and the payments come out of the pension fund, and you and all of your retirees are told, well, look, we have to reduce your pension this yeah. month because we had to pay for this knucklehead's behavior. If the whole citizenry has to pay, then we have a right to set up guidelines and uh, you know just a, something to keep the train on track. Well, I certainly agree with with, with what both of you just said and. And as uh, Imam corrected his biography, let me correct mine a little. I'm actually uh, on the staff of power right now. Um, My apologies. But what I want to lift up in, in relation to that is it's well known that Pennsylvania has, some, has one of the highest concentrations of right-wing groups of any state in the country. And uh, our attorney general has done almost nothing about it. Um, and... Uh, we really have to put pressure on the attorney general to come down on white supremacist groups around this entire state. They are, they are training as militias. They are threatening people. We have to be very clear that they have to be, their ha surveillance on them has to begin now. One of the more outrageous things that I learned in the last couple of weeks is the Oklahoma bomber, Timothy McVeigh, who is the, whose domestic terrorism killed more people than any other act of domestic terrorism, he was trained 
by that same Michigan militia that recently threatened to kidnap the governor that marched on the state house. So 30 years ago, when he did that, the FBI never followed up with that Michigan militia. The local police never followed up. They were allowed to continue their activities till what we have today. We have to insist that the attorney general of our state start cracking down on right-wing militia in this state. Yes, th thank you for those remarks, um, Rabbi Mordecai. And you're right, it's, it's chilling to think about that Timothy McVeigh's militia group is still roaming the United States and there's very little that is being done about that. I mean, we just had a suicide bomber here in the United States on Christmas day, level the city block in Nashville. And we're not even talking about that as a nation in part because he was a white man who was a part of the paramilitary group. Um, we do have a question from our executive director, Jacob Bender. So I'm going to turn it over to him before I continue with the next set of questions. Uh, th thank you, Timothy. Um, both Rabbi Heschel and Dr. Martin Luther King are now sanctified and idealized um, with, as uh, Rabbi Mordecai said, to make them more palatable to um, mainstream uh, America. Yet during those live, those two lives, both of them were severely criticized by um, people within their own communities um, for advancing uh, the cause of peace in Vietnam and economic justice. And I wonder if you see any parallels um, today uh, with that um, rebellious spirit within both of them um, that took to heart a line that I learned when I came to Philadelphia from the Quran which says, if, um, and I'm paraphrasing, if justice needs to be committed, if injustice is done by someone within your own community or your own family, you are required to oppose them, even if they're from your own community. And I wonder if any of the panelists could comment upon that um, sense of, um, fighting for justice, even if your stance is criticized by a, a wide range of opinion within your home community, your home synagogue or your church or your mosque? Well, I would like to certainly say that um, there's no surprise in that. We have experienced this idea that we can't talk about one another. We can't say that because we must present this united front, which we know, of course, is fake, because if it were true, we would have made further progress within our own community. We are so dependent on this positive. We're going to make progress, but positively. Now, I must admit that <clears throat> I was extraordinarily disappointed from the outcomes of the 60s as a child of revolution. My idea was not peaceful protest. That wasn't the section that I was particularly uh, attuned to. So I will admit that right now. I see, though, that there has got to be always a combination of strategies that we embrace. And I hear this importance of police action. And I think that's important. And we need those who are well aware, educated on the subject, as I've heard my brothers here say this evening, I think that's critical. For me, it's health and education and understanding that there's a strategy that's required to address that as well. And if there are people within our um, engagement who speak contrary, yes, we need to, as my grandmother used to say, that got to go behind the woodshed and we have to have a per personal and direct conversation because we are no longer in a position where we can make nice. These people are out front and they're using the guise of patriotism as access to what they want to do to suppress once again, even further back than we currently are. I am 
appalled at what has happened with the education, which again, like many instances that are occurring currently in our social order, that it took a year for anyone to come to terms with children who don't have access to the internet, and yet you want them to be virtually educated. My challenge with that is we are virtually educating a population where in Philadelphia, more than 56% are functionally illiterate and drop out of school. You, you can't have progress without educational support and it begins so early. When you have classrooms in the, in the best of situations, you have classrooms where there are one or two African-American and Latino children in a, class, in a virtual classroom of 15, for example, at the very basis, kindergarten, where the teacher doesn't call on the African-American child who is in front of the screen waving his hand, I know the answer, who then becomes frustrated with the educational process and essentially withdraws in that very space. This is being duplicated every day. We are so excited as they announce in the newspapers, oh, we've given away a thousand laptops so that children can access and internet. We reduce the cost of internet to $10 a month. If you are in the neighborhoods where poverty is in the 40%, $10 a month is too much. When people are in food lines trying to keep their families fed. So for me, we must come with a multi-pronged approach each one of us taking responsibility for those areas in which we hold expertise. And we have not tried that before. I can recall having been part of the, the Philadelphia experiment of whether or not African-American children were intellectually inferior or genetically inferior and being tested and put into advanced education that just meant I would be exposed to the Caucasian world from my neighborhood and taking now what they call upward bound classes and being taught, for example, French, which I couldn't speak to anyone in my neighborhood about. But that was supposed to make me a good colored girl who would understand the system what happened to me at 17 was a revolution where my own thoughts were like, no, you are still colored and you are still pushed to the back and you will have to be triple as good as anything presented. And are we not there now? Once again, you have to be so much better, so much more aggressive, so much more knowledgeable. You have to, you have, to have a PhD in order to be considered an expert in your area. When I initiated the effort to try to educate the African-American community about the HIV epidemic, I was confronted on two fronts. One, the government saying, we, we can't fund you. We're funding these um, other organizations, these gay white organizations. Um, we, we will uh, we'll listen to you, bring your, bring your argument to the table. And Black folks on the back end going, we don't know, know anything about that. We can't participate in it until the numbers reached the thousands that we said, oh, well, Sister Rashida is uh, now I'm a pioneer and a, an expert and all of that. It didn't matter whether or not your name appeared in the paper and people started saying, well, are you stealing money? Where's that red Mercedes that you're driving? All of those things. So we have to recognize in leadership, you are going to be attacked on as many sides as they can find entree but there must be a willing to remain committed and aware and, and engage in these conversations. I really appreciate where we are now because when you're thrust in the front and the knives are drawn and the guns are pointed, you are gonna make some decisions. And we are at that point, I believe right now. Indeed, thank you for that. Each of you in your remarks tonight in various ways have either directly or, or indirectly referenced the crisis of poverty, particularly in our city. I think that's something to remark upon, particularly when we're relating it to violence. I, I often 
remark on how Philadelphia is the poorest big city in America. And so it makes sense that during a historic pandemic and a crippling recession, we will see a skyrocketing in violent crime. As you just said, Dr. Rashida, you put people in desperate positions. You will often see desperate behavior. So my question to, and this is directed to any of you all, if, I would like to know if you could speak on King's efforts to dismantle our capitalistic system and what you think that would look like or how you think um, that could look if we were to succeed in doing that today. Well, I would say exploitation by any name is wrong because see, even under uh, governments that were quote unquote, I'm not gonna say socialist, but communistic, uh, people were still exploited. Now, financial literacy is something that is a responsibility for all of us, especially the leadership. People have to be educated as to not waste money, not spend money on things that are really of no value to them. And even Dr. Vashida, when, when, when you mentioned about healthcare, see, I always like to tell the health professionals, you can manage our illness, we have to manage our health. We have to be monitors and responsible for the things that we can control. And if we look back at the, the point that um, Jacob brought up about standing up for justice, even if it's against yourself, see the greatest oppression that many of us do is to ourselves, or we have greater oppressors among ourselves. And even though this doesn't uh, belittle what is being done by society, but many of the small things that we can do for ourselves will give us the strength to better confront. Because see, you can't have good schools without good neighborhoods. And if we just do simple things like trying to keep our neighborhoods clean, keep them presentable, then we begin to look at all the institutions that exist. But if we don't have a concern for good neighborhoods, for good homes, for good houses, and it's not just the uh, the how much the house costs, but it's how the occupants, how do they see their house? How do they take care of it? How do they manage their affairs? This gives you a foundation. Then you have something you can fight for. But uh, many of our youth, the reason why life doesn't mean anything to them, the, the value of life is nothing because they don't have no value themselves. And if their life doesn't have any value, then no one else's life has value. I mean, the, 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 the young man who was killed, the Temple student, it's unfortunate that now the thing that has been a plague on our community has reminded them that you can't let a cancer, you can't let a poison exist in the environment and think it's not gonna affect you. But you see how the perpetrators were arrested within 24 to 48 hours, even though a lot of the other crimes go unsolved. I mean, that same weekend, 10 people were shot, only one of them died. Now that's either because we have a greater response by the health profession or the shooters don't know how to shoot, <laughs> but uh, every bullet that didn't take the life created 20 to $30,000 worth of damage. And that is a burden on the health industry. So now, some of the responsibility is ours. And we have to get our own house in order because that's the third thing that Martin Luther King said. When you see an injustice, get the facts. Then confront the source of the injustice and then go home and begin to work on your own house, get your own house in order. It don't mean you have to be perfect, but we have to address issues that we know plague us. And, 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 and Dr. Uh, Tyler, uh, Reverend Tyler, I was with power when we went to Harrisburg with the school inequity, the inequity in school funding. See, all this leads to quality of housing. It leads to ability in education. It leads to employment opportunities. It leads to uh, the reduction of redlining and gentrification. The, they all go hand in hand. And Martin Luther King, he said he was a drum major 
we all have a different instrument to play, but we have to play the same song. We have to decide, okay, here's the song we're gonna play for this week because this is what we want the people to hear. And if you're the drummer, you do your drumming thing. If you're the, the tuba, you do the tuba. We have to be in harmony so that the message comes across not as just some dissonance or cacophony, but it comes across as something that can inspire people. And really, uh, we go back to the, all, some of those old spirituals from the slave days. We know that those songs inspired people. And then we can even go back to the rap. Sister Rashidi, you remember the rap in the 60s, the positive rap, the last poets, Gil Scott, come on. See, these things inspire people, but we do have um, exploitation of rappers today by the music industry. And that's done concertedly to actually keep people from waking up to what their real potential and possibilities are. Um, yeah, I also want to weigh in on that too. Yes, and please. I, I like to just simply say that um, I think that, so I, I agree, Imam, you're absolutely right that, I, you know, I don't get, I know people say that if we just abolish capitalism, all of the problems with, with money and uh, will be gone, but whether it's a monarchy, uh, communist regime in Russia, whatever, the people who want to exploit and who dominate with greed are going to be present and take advantage. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't issues with it, but I, you know. But when I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, Mackenzie Scott, former wife of Jeff, Jeff Bezos, and Jeff Bezos split their money. Jeff Bezos can't get enough of money, even with what he has now. He still he will die trying to get more, though he can never spend it. She has dedicated the last couple of years finding places to pour into black colleges, you know, important institutions and, and people who are generally doing good and trying to help them build their capacity. She gave money to my alma mater, Clark Atlanta University. I know she gave money locally, I think to Cheney or Lincoln or both. Um, and so it's, but I think that is about going back to what, you know, Rabbi Mordecai brought out, King's, you know, legacy, that enduring legacy, this revolution of values, right? Again, I said it earlier, I'm gonna say it again, it is about putting people first. And when we put people first in everything that we do, including our money, then we have a society that says that I don't need to have, you know, um, I don't even know what comes after a trillion, but I'm sure that there's something after that and somebody's trying to get to it, right? <laughs> that, but that I can be satisfied with, I don't know, a hundred billion and the rest I'm gonna pour back into, into society so that, you know, that we can all, um, you know, go to sleep at night with our bellies full and with rooftops over our head and clothes on our back. But, but that comes as a result of, there's just some kind of cancer in our country right now, where again, the, the focus is on ourselves and there is such a lack of accountability for one another it is one of the strengths of Western society is that, you know, the quote unquote rugged individually, individualism. It is also one of the great threats to Western society as we have seen in COVID-19 where people feel as wearing a mask is somehow an affront to your being able to be an individual as opposed to a great sacrifice that you take on to save your neighbor that you may or may not know. And I just think that, you know, that so much of that has been exposed in COVID-19. And I don't know how you how you reprogram people's minds. But as I see it, that is one of the great lingering challenges that even King could not uh, solve in his day. I want to lift up a phrase of Dr. King's that we haven't mentioned yet tonight, which is the creation of beloved community. You know, which is the antidote to what Dr. Tyler was just talking about. It's like it's, you know, he emphasized the need to be in community. He taught, as I was saying, about the interconnectedness of all things, the understanding that if one person is oppressed, that we all suffer. So lifting up that uh, interconnectedness, the fact that we live in beloved community, to try to create the conditions for beloved community is very important. You know, the, we live in a system 
um, that is uh, focused, that encourages greed and uh, encourages domination. I mean, one of the things that Dr. King began to lift up before others was really the whole notion of environmental justice. He knew uh, that we were connected. If we treat the earth in the way of domination, then eventually we treat all people in the way of domination. So the key here is to have a paradigm of cooperation rather than a paradigm of domination. In Philadelphia, in fact, is one of the centers in the country of creating cooperatives. So there are folks in Philadelphia that are trying to create producer cooperatives, getting people together to own their own businesses together. There's actually producer cooperatives and there's a whole employee owned ESOP thing happening in Philadelphia, uh, of getting employees to own it. So one of the ways that to uh, undercut some of the negative, the, the negative aspects of capitalism are cooperatives. And you know, getting out of a, a paradigm of domination, getting into a paradigm of cooperation. And at one point in his later years, Dr. King even called himself a democratic socialist, realizing that we have to have uh, economic systems that are more based on cooperation than exploitation. If there's anything that Dr. King spoke out against, it was exploitation. So we have to figure out how we create uh, economic systems, political systems that are based on cooperation as opposed to exploitation of power with instead of power over. And that's how we begin to create the kind of justice and equity that we need. And thank you. Hey, uh, and thanks to Scott. Uh, it's quadr uh, quadrillion. So <laughs> as I said to him, when I get there, I'll let you all know how it feels. <laughs> I'm going to get it, then give it all away. There we go. There we go. And speaking of Scott, Scott has also mentioned that he is here because of what he witnessed with the insurrection that attempted to overthrow the election on January 6th. Uh, Pastor Mark, you mentioned that quite eloquently in your opening remarks. He also has mentioned that during the era of President Trump's administration, he has experienced xenophobia and bigotry in ways that he had never has before. He mentioned that he's a young white man and while he doesn't experience what women and racial minorities may experience, he's gotten a taste of what that treatment looks like and sounds like he's committed to working with us to eradicate those things. And so with that, I was wondering if you all, our esteemed panelists could offer Scott some advice, someone who wants to commit to the work of social justice, committing to the idea of ending xenophobia and bigotry in our nation, um, someone who was jolted by what they saw on January 6th, if this was his introduction or if this was a culminating experience for him, how would you welcome him into this fight that you all have fought for nearly all your lives? I think that um, what uh, Rabbi Mordecai said really is a key for us making any progress, including for Scott, and that is to join with others. You you can't you cannot do any of this uh, alone, and so um, participating um, with organizations like Care who share your um, your value, who who share your concern, or with Power, where again. Um, you are not isolated. I mean, one of the things that we know is that if you are single, you're most likely to be plucked off than if you are with a group. Um, and I think that that's a, a critical lesson for all of us, you know, that we join with those who are focused on those topics, those issues, those values that are most important. And it doesn't always have to mean that you're, you know, out front, you know, banging the very loud drum because we need some other rhythms in the background as well. And so finding what you can contribute to um, a particular portion of the causes that we have, I think is really important um, to be able to join. And it's a protection for all of us. You know, you can't be missed if, you're, if someone is standing beside you. And certainly we have some instances being shown um, today when we see um, this food distribution which to me has been an amazing thing to continuously hear about. People with food drives and, and thousands of cars lining up to receive food, but people not going, well, you're black or you're white. What if it was, you're hungry, 
and we can feed you. And so I think those kinds of efforts um, are, are really important. And as insane as it has been with this COVID, even in my on my own small block, to have someone send a flyer to every door and say that at six o'clock, we're all coming out on the porch to wave at one another so that we recognize our loneliness and our personal isolation, but are gathered. Those small efforts are, are still critical. We, we know that we need to establish institutions that we control in our communities. If you have an expertise that you can lend to that development, then there's, there's your inroad to what value changing we can do. We have the need to get back to the social economic structures that brought us through times when Tulsa was so um, expansive and independent and the other cities around the country when Blacks actually left Reconstruction was able to do for self, as we've been told for a very long time, do for self. But we always had allies that were able to assist us in some of the things that we needed to get through. So I think, you know, there are some, some real clear concrete activities that we can engage in that I believe that are really important and require the team come together and really look at, as, as I mentioned early on, be aware of what the issues are and what the facts are that go with them. And then what is your place? Because we're all here on this planet with a part of the puzzle that needs to address the saving of humanity. You got to pull your part out and step in. Thank you for those wise words, um, Dr. Rashida. Do any of our other panelists have something they'd like to offer? You know, going back to what our dear brother, the rabbi said about um, confronting institutions or confronting structural oppression and the way this economic system is working, it really consumes individuals uh, to actually feed uh, the profit margin, to feed uh, the portfolio, stock portfolios, uh, what the, the third quarter earnings are. So we know that is an issue that has to be addressed from a tactical way. Strategically, people have to now become more, I uh, would just say resourceful with the resources they have. And the, the, this pandemic is forcing us to do that. Here's an example. We know that we have to have alternative energy sources. We know the energy sources we use today, there's a lot of injustice when it comes to the effect that it has on um, minority communities, black communities, we know that. But now strategically, we have to let our people know if you have energy coming into your house, you have to conserve it and, and be as effective and efficient in as use as you can. You'd be surprised, I used to do energy audits uh, with a solar energy group. And 30% of all the energy that comes into the average household, they must have just opened the window up because it just goes out the window. Now, even though we know uh, the energy companies exploit, we know that they pollute, we know that to some extent they are even inefficient but still it doesn't dissolve us or uh, absolve us of the responsibility we have on a strategic level. So we have to do strategic thinking when it comes to the individual. And then when it comes to addressing um, injustice, addressing exploitation, addressing all of the major issues, then we come together and tactically, we can say there should be a progressive rather than a regressive tax structure. Because even when you look at um, if someone has a hundred million dollars, they should be at a 90% tax rate <laughs> because they don't need a hundred million dollars to survive. So that is something that is tactical. And again, as a society, we come together and as Dr. Rashida has uh, again mentioned, all of us have mentioned it. We all have an instrument that we have to become proficient at. And we have to play our instrument. And the more we can get people in harmony, not only is the sound more resonating in society, but it's a richer sound. Because it's one thing to just have a fife and drum. But when you can add the violins and you can add the obis and you can add all of the instrumentation, 
it just makes the sound that much more rich that even the birds and the bees will join in with us. We can get all of creation, the more we can resonate together. But we have to decide, okay, here's the song we're gonna play this week. Everybody tune your instrument up in this key, practice all week, because when we come out, we want to be able to, uh, we just say, get our, have our message heard. And again, as Dr. King said, he's a drum major. The drum major actually directs uh, the, 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 uh, the harmony. He directs you know, where uh, the band is going, what they're gonna play, et cetera, the timing, everything. We have to have the ability and the willingness to know that sometimes Dr. Tyler has to be the drum major. Sometimes Dr. Rashida has to be the drum major. Depends on what song is being sung and which um, uh, uh, instrument we play. So again, we look at this is an opportunity for us because everything is now, as we may say, black and white. The gray areas have all dissipated and things are so clear that either you are working for people or I would like to put another uh, word out that we maybe should think about. Are you a uh, democrophobia? Do you have democrophobia? Do you have a fear of people ruling? So I would say that we see a lot of democrophobia in the air today, and it's a deadly disease, more deadly than the COVID-19. I'm not afraid of, uh, I'm not a democrophobe, uh, Imam, but I am afraid I just got my quadrillion and you already taken 90% of it, knocking me back down. Uh, <laughs> but you're gonna give it all away though, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But no, but that, that leaves you with 10 billion. There you go. That leaves you with yeah, 10 billion. So, really, it's <laughs> a food line up the team. <laughs> right. but, 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 um, I, but, but what I want to say in all seriousness to, to Scott and then an answer to that question is um, really, um, it is about being together in a, in a community of faith that supports you. And, um, you know, Dr. King's most powerful letter to me was the letter from the Birmingham jail, which was written in response to white clergymen who were trying to convince him to go back to Atlanta, not to insert himself in Alabama politics, and that he was moving too fast. And, you know, so it's a beautiful letter, but I've been thinking about it lately because of the silence of the white evangelical church in this moment. Um, I even caught uh, oh, a guy, I can't think of her last name, Joyce. Uh, she's one of the more popular televangelists now, Joyce Myers today, just a little bit of it. I want to see what she was saying. And she was struggling with how to talk about this quote unquote moment. And, you know, her, her answer was, you know, politics won't save us. We just need the Lord. Well, yeah, we need the Lord, but we also need some leadership and some courage and conviction from faith leaders. People need to hear us denounce certain things and they need to hear us lift up certain things. And so I say, get into a loving community. And what I can say about these three, you know, faith traditions in Philadelphia, that we have been there for each other and we've been bonded through our grief and through our tears. And, and our struggle is real. When Mother Emmanuel was attacked, our sister AME congregation and the, the pastor, my friend and others were gunned down our congregation was filled the next night to the rafters with, with Muslims and with Jewish folk and with Christians and non-believers. And likewise, when the attacks hit Christchurch in Australia, Muslims were gunned down. We were in masjids and mosques and, and there for one another. And likewise, in Pittsburgh with the Tree of Life, you know, I found myself sitting in the pulpit at Rodef Shalom and we were there and we, and when we couldn't do anything else, we just cried together. When we couldn't do anything else, just the act of being human with each other. It, it is to know that we're not alone in what we're going through, I think is the most valuable thing. And so as Dr. Rashida said, don't allow yourself to get picked off by being alone. We were not created to be in isolation. We can do this for a temporary moment for our health, but we were created to be in fellowship with one another. And that fellowship, you know, tonight we could have said that our differences are too great for us to come together in this space. 
We could have found all the reasons that we should not come together. But in spite of all the differences, we know that there's something much more in common that we hold. And that is what I think Dr. King was able to transcend and so many others um, of that generation. And we have to do the same thing. I just want to you know, just add to all that. The, the great lie of Western civilization is individualism. No person can ever live by his or her self. It is impossible. The nonsense we were taught about by John Locke, that the start of civilization or government was human beings coming together as individuals to create a government. There has never been, there can never be individuals living alone. That is a physical impossibility. We can only live with each other. We have to get past the great lie of the West and realize that we can only live in community. You know, as Dr. King said, we, our goal is to try to create that as beloved community. Thank you for the powerful assessment from, from each of you. Those are wise words to pass on to Scott and anyone who's listening today. The respective faith traditions represented today offer great wisdom and insight as it relates to that. And you all have just demonstrated that with your remarks. With that said, I think that's this is a good opportunity. If there are people who are watching who have questions, you can, if you're if you're watching, you can type your questions into the chat and I will read them um, for our panelists. If you are watching via Facebook, you can, you can enter your message there and we will do our best to get those questions to our panelists, but wanted to give our, our viewers an opportunity to offer or ask any questions that they might have. Um, Jacob, did you have did you have any questions for our, our panelists at the moment? Um, not a question, but speaking of giving away the money, uh, the quadrillion or trillion, so that it doesn't go into uh, nuclear submarines, but goes into the um, bank accounts of social justice nonprofit organizations like CARE, uh, you can contact us at pa.care.com. Um, we have. Um, all, we're all working from home these days, uh, as many of you are as well. Uh, we were had to give up our office at the beautiful Friends uh, Quaker Center in Central uh, City. But um, CARE, um, like many other organizations, depends upon the support uh, and donations and involvement of people like uh, yourselves. And we hope you will take uh, this opportunity to uh, donate and support um, both social justice organizations and the religious communities to which many of you belong. Because without the prophetic voice that we have heard here tonight, there will be much uh, missing uh, in the opposition, oppositional and dissenting movement. Um, that we have just gone through. So um, I hope you will join us in this struggle starting tonight. And again, thank you all for um, participating and listening. Uh, as Tim said, if any of you have questions, um, Tim, you can read them now. There is an incoming question from Facebook. Um, Christina asks, how can I better be prepared for the next so-called Donald Trump? Can I just say that- Or, um, such, or such person, say, Ross Power. That that's uh, Chrissy, Chrissy Mosley is um, a Mother Bethel, one of our distant members. She is a wonderful poetess. And since the pandemic has been offering our prayer each Sunday through an original poem, and uh, you got, I wish I had it where I could just pull it out. Maybe she can post it for me in the uh, Facebook chat, but it's worth hearing about, you know, for you all in your own time. Um, can I, I just want to say one thing in, in response to that, that um, I won't talk about the, the particular instance, but I did go through something once where um, a group of us who were in um, a prolonged experience together, um, allowed ourselves to be picked off one by one by you know a, a group 
that wanted to dominate everyone, you know, um, and each one, you know, so, I, so I'm very dear now to that poem, that Martin Niemöller uh, poem who came out of Nazi Germany, you know, when first they came for the unionists, I didn't speak up because I wasn't in union. Then they came for the Catholics, I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for the Jews, I didn't speak up because I was a Christian. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak up. That's real. That is absolutely real. And I lived it, you know, on a much smaller mic, you know, no, no loss of life, but just watching how a group took one person, they start with the weakest in the group, the most vulnerable, and they take all, they, they dominate them and no one says anything. And by the time they get to you, to the strongest people, there's no one there to fight with you. And, you know, and that experience has, has really shaped me. And so I say that, you know, you know, you get ready for the next Donald Trump by not allowing, you, you give that, that kind of hatred, that kind of speech, no quarters at all. And, you know, it's when I watch them tear down Black Lives Matter banners at Metropolitan AME in DC, that's another one of our sister congregations. As we said, it starts with tearing down banners and it ends with tearing down people physically. And so we have to stop it with the banners. And Mordecai, you are right, that we do need to put pressure on the state and the FBI about the hate groups that are in our state. They should not be that comfortable in this state. And so you, you can't wait until something tragic happens. You have to be on it and be diligent. Right, you know, another, another word for what Dr. Tyler is saying is solidarity. We have to show solidarity at every moment, just like many of us showed up when the Muslim ban happened and we went to the airport. At the, whenever anything happens, we have to be out in the streets, out in the public together. There is no substitute for solidarity. Yes, absolutely. So solidarity is key, as Rabbi Mordecai mentioned, as Pastor Mark mentioned, we have to empathize with our fellow humans and come together with this notion of your struggle is my struggle. I am because we are. Right. And, and, and beyond that, and to, to quote King, since we're celebrating him today, a threat to justice anywhere, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. everywhere right. And so uh, with that, I would like to see if our panelists have any closing remarks. You all have been very gracious with your time this evening. And we could speak all night about Dr. King and the impact of his legacy and how we can play that out, out in our faith traditions. But I know you all have obligations that you must get to as well. And so I wanted to know if you all had any parting words, any closing remarks for our viewers today. Well, I um, I'm actually made a, a notation here that someone asked uh, in the chat room of uh, what outcomes from this panel discussion were we expecting? And I, you know, I've been thinking about it as I've got notes all over this piece of paper. I'm, I'm very pleased with all that you all have said tonight. Um, but for me, it is an encouragement of participation to in to really encourage people to come forth and participate your voice your actions and your dollars are really needed if we're going to address the ills that we've been talking about tonight that um, that Dr. King stood for that voiced was aware and gave his life for we, we have to participate and we can't sit back and say how awful it is. And so many times, those are the kind of conversations that I hear. Oh, isn't it awful? It's terrible. Someone should do something. Well, you're the someone that should do something. And that is, you know, is really about participating and joining forth with whatever organization, body, faith practice that you are close to. Um, because we cannot do it as separatists. We have to have solidarity. We have to come forth and acknowledge that without one another, survival is highly unlikely. And if we allow the, quote, patriot terrorists to assume 
all of what's going on in our lives. And we are the ones who are responsible. We are held accountable for that. And we have to step up and we have to do something. Um, engage your talents in the work that we need to do. That, that's where I am with it. Let's, let's get going. Let's move forward and, and address some of these challenges that we've discussed tonight. Thank you for those wise words, Dr. Rashida. You know, whenever, whenever we have these um, gatherings, um, it can be looked at as entertainment or pastime, or it can be something that inspires people to rethink what they're doing, to have a different perspective on what they're doing, to see that they're not in this by themselves, uh, that there is really, uh, um, most of humanity will go in whatever direction uh, they are directed to go in, they're inspired to go in. And even when we look at the 70 some million people who really wasted their votes, we know that they were inspired to do it because uh, this was the loudest thing they heard. Now, if we can, come to the awareness that we have a network, but we have to build infrastructure so that we can respond to the challenges that we all face. Uh, but I think gatherings like this enable us to be inspired by each other, to really show the love and the concern that we have for each other, and to resolve that this um, instrumentation is so harmonious with what is in my very soul that I'm looking for the next opportunity. And I, I, I wanna leave with this quote from a war movie, The Dirty Dozen. And when the one who was playing the general, uh, I'm not gonna mention his name, but he was watching the soldiers march by and parade. He said, yes, they look very nice, but can they fight? <laughs> So we sound nice, but now are we willing to fight? Are we willing to come forward and really commit ourselves uh, to whatever we can bring with ourselves, with our material possessions? We have to bring it to, uh, we just say, to use uh, for something greater than ourselves. Because as Muhammad Ali said, doing this is the price we have to pay for living in this world. So let us all be willing to pay the price, no matter what uh, the cost is, because uh, what we're trying to get is priceless. So we can't put no expense on it. Thank you so much, Amen, Kenneth, for, um, for those wise as well. I'll jump in. So let the doctor Tyler, let Dr. Tyler have the last word here. Um, so I, I want to two things that. Uh, people mentioned uh, sharing the pain, crying together, uh, and love. You know, we live in a society where it's not it's not welcomed to cry in public. It's not welcome to talk about our pain in public. And in fact, the way we get closer to each other many times is understanding each other's pain, understanding, being able to cry with each other, being un being able to understand what is it that's bothering the other. That's how we get to know each other. We, only, we, get, we get to truly know each other by understanding what causes us to cry, where our pain is. And that is something that we have to begin to be able to share in public, in private with each other. It, it is now an important statement. This society is killing us. And everybody's gotta be open about that. We are all dying one way or another from what is happening in this world. And our hearts are breaking. And we have to be able to talk about that. And the corollary of that is loving each other. Because when we share our pain is when we learn how to love each other as well. When we see our vulnerabilities, where we share our humanity. And if Dr. King taught us anything, it was that we had to love each other. And we have to love each other in those moments where there's pain. And we have to take that pain and we have to take that love. And as the Imam just said, we have to take it out. We can't just be it at home. And you know, Dr. King did wanna create a, 
a mass nonviolent movement. You know, and we have to be out in the streets and we have to know how to be together in a nonviolent way showing power. So our next steps are learning how to love each other, share our pain with each other, and learn how to create a mass nonviolent movement to bring about the changes that are going to fulfill Dr. King's legacy. Thank you for those wise words, Rabbi Mordecai. And, um, and let me just, I'll be brief in this closing. I'm glad to see uh, on Facebook Live, uh, my dear brother, who's our board co-chair now for power, uh, Abdul Halim Hassan, who introduced me to so many of you. And uh, so I'm glad to see him on tonight. I'll end tonight with uh, Dr. King's own words, which seem to tie in beautifully with uh, all of the three previous panelists. We must learn to live together as brothers, and I add parenthetically, as sist and sisters, or we will all perish together as mm -hmm. fools. That's right. We are tied together in a single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, and whatever affects one directly, your mosque, your masjid, your synagogue, your church, affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the way God's universe is made. This is the way it is structured. And those are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. May the reader and hearer go and do likewise. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mark. And thank you for each of our esteemed panel today. We thank you for sharing your time, your wisdom, your insights, your passion. We are better for having sat with your words this evening. We thank you all who have joined us either via Zoom or via Facebook Live. Thank you for listening to this program today. Again, this is Care Philadelphia. I am Timothy Welbick, the civil rights attorney for Care Philadelphia. And I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Ahmed Antiglioglu. He is our community outreach coordinator and our executive director, Jacob Bender. And thank you for allowing us to continue doing this work, engaging the community as we continue to fight for and to build Dr. King's beloved community.